hopefully this is better. Is there still a, an echo? I can hear you. It sounds good to me, but yeah. Okay. All right, cool. So, um, all right. So, yeah, we just talked about, you know, you not, you didn't really have plans to go into politics, um, but, you know, you were really interested in how poverty was created in cities and things like that. And um, so, yeah. All right. Well, why don't we get into, you know, a question that a lot of people, I'm sure they want to know. Um, and you actually have covered this in other local news outlets. But for those that are listening, why did you choose not to run for reelection this time? I have always, um, I, I knew I would serve two terms. I knew that that was um, really my instruction that I received uh, from the very beginning, um, just from a lot of prayer. And I always have been a big proponent of just the next generation and making room for um, the, the next realm of leadership to come forward. And I've seen so many um, elected officials that stay in seats until they almost die. They never mm -hmm. think about, um, you know, making room for people to come after you. And right. I, I really wanted to continue to move forward in what God has for me. I'm, I'm really big about impact. I don't need a position um, in order to do that. And so I really wanted to continue to just move forward in my life and make an impact in a different way. I've, I've done what I needed to do as mayor in terms of policies and bringing resources and economic development and really shifting a trajectory in the perception of Compton in a lot of ways. And so I know that at this stage in my life, I can make a tremendous impact, really building vehicles to generate wealth that do not currently exist. And I can't do that as mayor. So I'm going forward to really focus on building some missing infrastructure like um, financing institutions and community development corporations so that we can build entrepreneurs, that we can facilitate home ownership, that we can expand nonprofit capacity, that we can ensure that we have a new generation of, of homeowners and people that are building their credit and, and youth programs. So I'm, I'm really going back to my original mission of community development, but from a, a whole total different vantage point. And I plan to work in alignment and support the city, but I know that what I plan to do and what I'm purposed to do in this season of my life, um, I can't do from this role as mayor. Mm, definitely, definitely. So yeah, um, you have your background, your educational background, you know, is in policy, it's in um, urban, urban planning and, you know, specific concentrations in economic redevelopment. And so I see that that, that definitely is your, your biggest interest um, from what you've chosen to study. To study. And um, shout out to you. I did see that you also received a full academic ride for your BA. Yes. Wow, that's yes. amazing. So <laughs> yeah, definitely. So let's um let's kind of go a little bit back. You know, like when I talk to people, I like to kind of see like what is it about like their upbringing upbringing that has shaped the person that they are, the um, decisions that they make. And so, what was it about? You know, that what are growing up? You know. What are some of the biggest lessons that come to mind when you think back on your childhood that your your mother and grandmother and just the elders instilled in you? My mother uh, was just such a force in my life and she was a single mom. Uh, my mother never made excuses. She never blamed anyone. She had zero bitterness with my father. So I didn't grow up with a deficit um, in that regard, but she was very vision oriented. She had a strong vision for my family. She was a team builder. She let my brother and I know that we are members of a team that we must make our contribution in order for um, our family to continue to grow and that um, she had a, a very high expectation for me and she drenched my, my family with love. And so I grew up you know, poor. I didn't know I was poor until I got to high school and I started learning about economics. And I'm like, mom, you only make this much. So that means we are poor. But um, she, it, we just we had so much joy in my in my life. And um, my mom just had such an impact on me. But she raised me to have integrity, to do what you say you're going to do, to finish what you start, um, to really have strong character and to have values and to just be an individual leader. I, I never followed anyone and I would actually get in trouble if I follow someone. She would literally tell me if I ever get a call that you got in trouble and you were following somebody else, it's on. So my mother was no joke. Um, 
people that know her, they know that she was, um, she seemed strict, but she was so much fun and we just had so much love. So shout out to uh, my queen mama for raising me and um, I, I raised my daughter in the same way. Mm, definitely, definitely. Yeah, so you know, you um, you recently became a mother within the last few years. Um, yes. Talk a little bit about that. How has that been for you? And just, you know, becoming a mother while still in your role as mayor? Yes. Um, being a mother has just been a, a highlight of life. Um, I, you never know how much you can love someone until you have your own baby. And um, my daughter is just everything. She's such a little leader. Um, she's so compassionate and just so much love. And she's funny. Um, but I, I love being a mother. And to me, that for my mom, she literally raised us that we were her mission statement. And she made so many sacrifices for my brother and I that I feel compelled to, to make that same level of sacrifice with my daughter and just give her my best. And at the same time, I want to make more opportunities for other babies. So um, that's what I'm looking forward to doing in this next stage of my life is spending more time with family, making other families stronger um, and just continuing to build as a community. Definitely, definitely. Okay, nice. So um, let's talk a little bit about like politics, your role in different um, city departments before mm -hmm. you actually became mayor, you know? Um, what, what were some of the cities that you worked with before um, becoming mayor of mm -hmm. Compton? Yes, I, I worked, I started out working in the city of Gardena. I worked in the economic development department. Um, I also worked uh, as a housing coordinator um, and it was a really small city, so I got to wear a lot of hats and get a lot of work done. And I worked under a wonderful woman. Her name is Yvonne Mallory, and she was so um, strict. She was uh, hard to work for, but she, she really helped groom me and train me um, in such a wonderful way. So um, I'll, I'll always be grateful to her. Um, then I worked in the city of Inglewood um, in economic development under Richard McNish. And he is a legend. He was one of the founding fathers of Watts. Um, he is literally, he was one of the also founding members of WC, uh, WLCAC. Um, and he really trained me to, to be a fighter, to just, um, my mother definitely trained me to be a fighter, but he showed me how to fight in the realm of um, just really in, politically in, in an institution. And so uh, he was hard, uh, but I, he really helped me um, grow in a lot of different ways and really wanted to push me forward. And so I got an opportunity to um, work on special projects with the mayor there. And I learned so much by just being in the fire. Um, I remember he was uh, supposed to give this presentation that I actually put together for him in front of, it was a huge thing for economic development. And he called me uh, the day before and he's like, "Hun, he had a really raspy voice. He was like, Hun, I'm sick, I can't make it. And I thought I was going to die because <laughs> he told me that I was going to have to do this presentation, but he told me you're ready. And he used to call me uh, Tiger Paws. And <laughs> he, to this day, I know he will be proud of me, um, but I, I learned so much from people like that. And then later I was recruited to come work in the city of Compton's redevelopment agency. And um, my, a friend of mine that was the deputy director, he had asked me to take a look at it. And it was really powerful because I had never um, really searched for a job. It was always God, like literally directing my path. And I, it was in my spirit to just go on the city of Compton's website. And he, the Lord literally told me, I'm just gonna tell you guys, God is real. He talks. If you talk to him, you spend time with him, he'll, he'll lead and guide you. But he literally told me to go onto the city of Compton's website. And he said, there's a project manager position there. And I almost died when I went on that website and saw the, the project manager position on there. And I just closed it. And I told um, my good friend, Debbie, that I work with about it. And I had shared with her that I knew I was going to be leaving. I just felt I was getting ready to leave. And so make a long story short, I applied for this position in Compton, uh, beat out 25 other candidates, scored number one, um, and literally took this step of faith. And I took a pay cut to come work in Compton. I, I knew this was where God wanted me to be. Um, the backstory is at the very same time, uh, my husband and I, we were working um, in ministry at Faith Inspirational Church. And I had found myself in Compton like every week just serving. And then at the same time, we were looking for a home. And a friend of mine asked me to look at this community in the center of Compton. 
that had just been built. And so long story short, we bought a home there, uh, sight unseen. It was literally one block away from City Hall, one block away from my church. And then later, three months later, I learned that I actually received the job. So I knew that this is where God wanted me to be. I knew that he sent me um, for this assignment. Um, I didn't know exactly then that I would run for mayor, but I knew that he was going to have me make an impact. So I knew that this is where I was supposed to be. Definitely. Wow, that's a really powerful story. And thank yes. you for sharing that, you know. So, I mean, my immediate follow-up question well, I guess before we get into that, how was that experience like? How was that transition like for you um, coming and moving to Compton and to begin to work within that role in the city of Compton? It was a, a really wonderful experience. Um, I loved the community I lived in. There were a lot of just young professionals that had recently moved back. Um, we were all just getting started here. Um, I was serving a lot in the community and I had already had a chance to meet a lot of wonderful people. And then I was working on capital projects with the redevelopment agency, which was really exciting to me. Um, we were able to get uh, the Gateway Town Center uh, built out in phase one. We also started the transit center, the community center. Uh, the, there was a new parking structure. So it was a big level of investment in Compton that I got a chance to work on the ground level. And um, but at the same time, in working with developers, um, I just really saw how political interference was just a, a detriment to the community. And I took it so personally because obviously I work there, but I live there. And I'm like, these are people that are working hard every single day and they don't have time to watch government. And we had elected officials just out for themselves and it just infuriated me. And that's when I began looking for new leadership. Um, and so that that was my experience working in Compton. Mm, definitely, definitely. Okay, and so when you decided to run for mayor, and you know, subsequently, you know, became elected in in a historical situation, like you were the youngest mayor elected to Compton. You know, like what were some of your biggest plans for the city, and do you feel that you have accomplished these goals? Yes, um, I came in with a, a vision of for Compton that was really inspired by the people. Um, I started out doing just focus groups and asking people what did they want for their city. And after um, a lot of prayer and God just really laid out this really simple strategy um, that I uh, proceeded to move forward. And some of the biggest things were um, focusing on public safety, focusing on economic development, youth development, um, a healthy Compton, bringing farmers markets and more grocery stores and um, focusing on um, bringing more retail options and more grocery stores. We had very few options grocery store wise, um, focusing on um, additional resources for the community, public private partnerships. I knew that in order for the city to reach its full potential, we had to partner. Um, and so many of those uh, goals I actually put together a four year report after my first term. And uh, we have a second uh, report coming forward, but 90% of what um, we set out to do has been done. Um, and one of the biggest things was measure P, which was a measure, a 1% measure um, in order to dedicate resources to capital infrastructure. And as of last week, we actually received $40 million to repave um, the, the, all of the streets in Compton that have a need. Um, and then we also have now a dedicated source of revenue for maintenance so that the city never gets into disrepair again. And people don't realize they casually, you know, blame me for the potholes, but potholes take 25 years to develop. And if the city had actually maintained our street system, we wouldn't even have potholes. And so I came into the city with a $43 million deficit that I inherited. And so that deficit now has been reduced to $16 million. Uh, we are on track to approve our payment plan so that it could be completely eliminated. Uh, we are also preparing another $55 million investment so that we can restore the remainder of our parks, add more lighting, uh, Wi-Fi throughout the city, just really bring Compton to the 21st century in which we deserve. And what people also don't recognize is these strategies and these plans could have happened literally five, six years ago. This same strategy that was just approved by this city council was brought forward to previous city councils, but because people weren't paying attention and we had poor leadership, they literally voted no for investment in plain sight. And so I just cannot underscore the importance of just getting involved at what's happening at the local level. 
you know, many times, especially our generation, we pride ourselves on being woke, but most people are not. They don't know what's happening with their mayor, with their city council, and that these decisions are being made right, right before your eyes. And people don't even, they don't complain. They don't say anything about it until they hit a pothole, until they break their rim. And then, then they want to know, well, what, what's going on here? And I'm like, y'all, I've been fighting about this for five years, and now right. people are um, focused on it. But um, there's always a backstory. So I just challenge people to get involved. Definitely, definitely. So I guess we can kind of like transition to a question that I'm sure is on a lot of people's minds. Um, you know, you, t you spoke a lot about, you know, during your journey, there were people that, you know, helped to prepare you, people that, you know, gave you positive reinforcements that you were, you know, well on your journey and that you were prepared to um, step into the next big role. So during your time as mayor in the city of Compton, are there, you know, a, a group of young folks that you have been working with um, and specifically maybe a group of um, young African-American folks to kind of groom the next generation of, um, you know, black youth, you know, uh, to be involved in, in politics as well? Yes. Um, well, first of all, my chief of staff, Melissa, she served with me for seven years um, right by my side. She uh, I always thought that she would serve as the next mayor. That was always the strategy. Um, and after honestly seeing and experiencing all that I've gone through to sit in this role and to serve the community, she it, it was just too much for her. It's literally our own people are inflicting trauma on the very people that are here to serve us. And that's a conversation that we should have as a community is how, how do we support black leadership and do we hold the, the, the right people accountable? Because just as a black woman sitting in this role, I have been highly disrespected. And most people, they have, they, they'll come to me privately and say, Oh, I don't know how you've been able to do it. How could you stand with people, you know, lying and being disrespectful and continually, but it, how many people have actually, you know, went to a, a elder person and told them, you know, you shouldn't speak with her like that. That's our mayor. Or how many people have actually got on social media when they heard something crazy or disrespectful and actually said, you know, we, we shouldn't be speaking like this to her. This is, this is our mayor. Or let's just have some respect. Or, or where are the facts? You know, I, I'm a facts based person. You know, do, do you have any facts or are you just spreading lies on people? And so I have had to endure so much sitting in this role and I, I could not for the life of me at this stage, especially through COVID and everything that we've been through, I couldn't, I couldn't ask her to, to step forward into this role because she knows what it was all about. And she, she served with me through it all. I mean, we have cried for, prayed, fasted for Compton. And I mean, you all would never know the full story until maybe one day I'll write a book about it, but I, I couldn't ask her to do that. And especially if she had actually just lost her father to COVID, um, unfortunately. And so people are, are dealing with many things. But beyond that, I've supported uh, Black women to be elected in Compton. Um, our Compton College Board member, Dr. Sharani Little, she's a, a personal friend of mine, an advisor, a, a confidant. Um, she serves with distinction, highly educated, experienced. Um, she's actually a chief with CAA over global in inclusion for the, the whole world. And so she is a whole boss and she she's raised in Compton, raised two kings in Compton. So she is everything. And she, she I asked her if she would run. She she said no. Um, I supported Sandra Moss, who serves on the school board. Um, she's gone through hell um, with a really lack of support from our own community. So there, there's a lot of issues that we really have to address as a community. But in terms of young people, I, I've supported young people that head up organizations like Runway for Peace, Children Striving Together. Um, we started an initiative called Compton Open Mic um, to create a platform uh, for young artists and creatives to come together. Um, Morta JB, she was our host. Um, and, and that was the opportunity for her to be able to show her gifts and her talents. I've had fellows in my office um, I had a, a black fellow from Haiti. I had um, a young lady from a local um, a local college. I've had another uh, local fellow that actually went on and applied to law school. Um, a, a black woman, and so I've I've continually supported local black leadership. Um, there's a young man running for city council, um, Hub City Dre. I, I've supported him and his organization for years and encouraged him to seek public office because he saw the battles that I went through and I and he knew that he could make a difference because he had served the community and 
love the city. And th those are the real, the biggest requirements for me. Do you love the city? And if you love it, do you serve it? And do you serve it when no one is looking? Do you serve without a position? And so those are the requirements for leadership for me as a bare minimum. But um, I, I've supported Black women across the nation. Many of the Black mayors you see in major cities, I've supported them. Many of them that sit in Senate, um, I've, I've flown out on a moment's notice. Um, I've raised money. I mean, I, I've, I've been a part of One Million Women Strong. I mean, national organizations to bring up more Black female leadership and just more Black leadership in general. I'm a, I'm a part of groups that people don't even know that exist that are focused on Black leadership. And I, I'll just end at this part and put a pin in it. When I was elected in 2013, I went to my then supervisor at the time, my then senator, my then assembly person, um, and I asked them, can we create a pipeline for Black leadership? I was young. I broke through without someone dragging me. I, I stepped forward. I didn't have any connection to anybody politically. No one ran my campaign. No one gave me a big check to do this. I, my, my husband and I, we put in our hard-earned money over the years, and put it in my campaign. And still to this day, my husband is, and, and myself are my biggest campaign donors ever. So people don't know that story. But as I got in, into the seat, I recognized that we need a pipeline. We need an institute for leaders. And so I went to leadership and it just wasn't a priority. And then as leaders changed, I went to them again. And I have witnessed my, my chief of staff, Melissa, is a witness. But um, I, I'm one person. I have literally fought so many battles for I'm fighting on the city council. I'm fighting external battles. I'm trying to support leadership that's coming forward locally and externally. And there's only so much one person can do. But in this next phase of my life, I do plan on supporting leaders. I've always built young people. I, my first job, I was mentoring. And so I chose to go into ministry to mentor young people. And now those those young people are adults now. So I will always make room for the next generation. But a lot of people make assumptions and assume um, without without knowing the facts. But and, and that's a big problem with I think this this whole social media age that we live in. People don't require facts. They don't look for facts, but they're quick to make a comment or, or to, to form judgment. So um, I'm glad you asked me that question. Yes, definitely. Well, I'm actually really glad I asked that, too, because, again, you don't really know unless you ask and then the context that the person is able to provide just helps you even understand more like their decision. I'm really um, sorry to hear about the experiences that you've had as mayor and, you know, kind of taking the brunt of people's frustrations and being disrespected when you stepped into this role to serve the community, you know, and um, I think that that's probably something that people need to also here, which is your side of, of the story and your experiences. So I'm definitely looking forward to the book when you choose to write <laughs> it, for sure. Definitely. Yes. Um, so I guess the follow-up question to that would be, you know, you talked about, like, you know, you have plans um, or you, you have people that you thought would be, you know, perfect to take your seat after you left um, the, the Compton as mayor. But unfortunately, you know, those people saw your experiences and kind of, you know, began to, to, to weigh if that was something that they wanted to do. And so um, on the back end, you know, you've um, publicly endorsed your seat um, to someone in the community. So can you talk a little bit about why you chose this person and what exactly do you think that they can bring to serve in this role? Absolutely. Um... Well, I have endorsed Christian Ray Naga, who is a, a young um, gentleman in the community that has served, but I, I've known him for eight years and he has literally been on the front line serving in the community. He's been commissioners for many years. He was a leader in our My Brother's Keeper program. Um, he's led uh, different events for uh, bringing the community together for unity and prayer. Um, he's literally served tirelessly. He's worked with me on the Measure P campaign, which we won by a very narrow victory because we had a, a whole older generation who was spreading propaganda, but it's like we needed this resource for our community. And he was right there. And so I've not only do I know him, I know his aunt um, who I've known her before I became mayor. She's always served in the community. And when I was um, in youth ministry, we were over a movie in the park. And with without a, a big to-do 
she knew I was having this event and she brought her whole beauty salon to the park to give kids haircuts with, without any question. And so that, that is the, the family that this young person comes from. And um, I have mentored him. I have seen him sacrifice. I have seen him serve when no one was looking. This is not something that he wanted to do. Um, this is something that after a lot of prayer, um, he decided to make the sacrifice because he's seen what I've gone through. He's seen the lies. He's seen the disrespect. He's seen how the, the long, tireless hours that are put in. Um, he understands I, I earn $600 a month for a full-time job. Most people don't know that, but I'm right. literally serving and sacrificing for my community. And so um, I've watched him grow as an individual. Um, he's made goals in his own personal life to um, become a realtor and to be able to financially secure um, a home for him and his family, retire his mom. I've watched him accomplish these things and humbly and, and truly doing these things from the, the love of his heart. And that, that's the type of, in my opinion, the type of leadership that we need. And we cannot solely just support someone only because they're black. And I, I have seen what that has done to the community. And what most people don't know in 2015, so in 2019, there was a switch in the council district, District 1. We elected Michelle Chambers, thank God. Mm -hmm. But the former person that was there, it was very public because the, the news media covered that this person was literally voting no on investment to the city. We had uh, a partner with Netflix that wanted to revitalize all the city parks at no cost to the city of Compton. And we literally had someone sitting on the Diaz voting no and influencing other council members to vote no. And it wasn't the first time they voted a no against Venus and Serena Williams uh, opening a resource center in partnership with the city. They voted no on performing art centers and this is all public record. Mm -hmm. And so at that time, this person was in office. Um, she got into a runoff with the Latino gentleman who was also from the community. His family owned um, a, a well-known grocery store here. Um, Allatory Market is public information. And the elders in the community came together and um, they decided that they were, they rather support um, Jane Azarita coming into another term instead of moving forward with new leadership. And the city literally suffered for the next four years. And I promised them, I told them, I said, I respect you all because I know the battles you fought to be here and to, to be in these roles and um, and, and just th just the struggle in general. So I respected their decision, but I did promise them as a result of what happened that I would never be a part of not supporting who I personally believe in my heart, in my spirit was best for Compton. And so henceforward in 2021, I cannot support someone that just popped out of the, the woodwork that has never mm -hmm. served, that I do not I've, I've never seen them be a part of any initiative of, of anything positive or any program. I mean, we, we've done so much work in the community, in the trenches. And if I've never seen a mayoral candidate a part of anything, then they may be just seeking the position for themselves. And maybe that their heart is not in it for the community. And for me, if you can't serve, you can't lead. And then those are just my personal requirements. And so that, and I will stand on that. And some people don't like it. They feel that I'm responsible for, you know, changing someone's heart or, or preparing someone to sit in a role, but that, that's not my personal responsibility. I, I have mentored Black people. I have mentored Latino people. I have mentored God's people because I'm a child of God, mm -hmm. but I, I will not stand by and support someone that I know is unqualified or that I know has integrity problems because, because they're Black. I'm, I'm not doing that. Not me. Definitely. Definitely. Okay. Um, cool. Well, I had some questions written down, but I feel like during the conversation, you know, it's kind of just hitting on a lot of them. Boom, 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 okay. you know, but, um, okay, here's a good one. And then, um, I don't, I don't want to take too much of your time. We're, we're actually about to hit two o'clock. Um, okay. so how much more time would you say that you can be on this, uh, live so that I could. I have about 10 more minutes, if that's okay. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Okay. Okay, so maybe like four more questions if that's cool. Okay. So I'll do two for mine and then two from the user user submitted uh, questions. Okay. And um, I guess I'll start with that one first to make sure that we get those in there. So um, when I post it, you know, if people have questions, um, I'll try to, you know, squeeze them in there. Um, one question that I've seen that kept coming up is um, regarding the sheriffs in Compton. So... Um, the Compton Sheriff Station has um, a lot of uh, spotlight on it. I know that um, 
I don't know if it was NBC or ABC News. They just did like a huge 20 minute in depth special about it. But there's gangs inside the Compton station. And, um, you know, it came out in the Andres Guardado case that, um, you know, as well that maybe these that the kid got shot because some of the officers maybe have been in that the gang, the bandito gang, I think it's called. Yeah. Well, the story is we have people that we're paying with our tax dollars that are um, have created these cliques inside the police station and supposedly, well not supposedly, according to the whistleblower, they get in tattoos by like killing or shooting people like the residents in the community or whatever. Mm -hmm. So. I kind of, I guess maybe two questions from that. Um, how could something like this, you know, like grow within a department um, and kind of grow unchecked? Even though I want to say that I know the gangs inside the Com Compton Sheriff Station isn't exclusive to the police department. That's not a, a new thing. But since it's in Compton, I want to ask you, how do you think something like that has grown um, out of control in a sense? And um, you also had did a press conference with um, a local businessman in LA, um, Taco Mill. And um, mm -hmm. in that press conference, you talked about, you know, your experience with the sheriffs and people wanted to know, was there any, any follow up with that um, after that press conference? Um, yeah, absolutely. Well, first of all, um, I'll, I'll work backwards from your question. So uh, Taco Mill and others um, have taken legal action against the sheriff's department. Um, they'd have to take, take care of themselves and do what they needed to do legally. Um, but as part of that same press conference, the city of Compton um, and really with our city attorney, Damon Brown and our leadership, we requested for the attorney general to step in and do an independent investigation. And after many petitions, the attorney general did agree to do an independent investigation on Compton oh, Sheriff Station. So they're under investigation now. Um, we've also been in contact with other uh, bureaus of investigation um, and they are looking into these investigations and they will publish their report publicly. And so uh, we are letting justice take its course in that regard, but um, we are not finished um, addressing issues within the Sheriff's Department. The city of Compton does plan to take um, additional action that will be public uh, very soon. Um, as a result of some other issues that have arose um, internally. And so we, we are moving forward in ensuring that the residents get the respect they deserve and that our tax dollars are respected, our lives are respected. And that's a bare minimum. We shouldn't have to be in contract with someone that doesn't respect us or that is harming us. And so we are continuing to take action. Um, and as I said, you will hear more about that uh, very shortly. We've already taken action as a body. Um, and then in terms of um, really kind of what prompted me to share. Um, my incident had happened about a year prior and I knew that there will be a window of opportunity where me sharing my story would have a, a, a cause and effect. And when these situations happen with these young men in my community, um, I knew that the media and just the kind of society in large would just diminish and minimize their testimonies. And so I came forward to really validate that this is an issue and that these issues are happening widespread. Even my, myself as the mayor, I'm not immune. And so um, I hope that it would give some fuel to the fire in order to launch that investigation, which ultimately did happen. But um, I don't know if that would be the case if just um, these, unfortunately, these young African-American men stood and, and told their story because we've seen that happen time and time again um, throughout the county where they've come forward and maybe they've taken legal action, but there hasn't been a systemic response to these allegations. And so that's something that must be uh, addressed. And then in terms of how did this even happen, the Sheriff's Department is, is really a paramilitary organization. It is run from the top down. The Sheriff of LA County has really unilateral power. He's fighting right now with the Office of Inspector General when there was a, 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 a ballot measure approved by the people of Los Angeles County Measure R, which mandated civilian oversight and subpoena power. And the sheriff of LA County right now is ignoring subpoena power. And so we need to understand that there's a system set in place, but we have one person that is empowered by the structure, by the confines of this structure to even buck that system. And so when there's such a level, a lack of accountability and transparency and really a collective action 
for for these mechanisms to be brought to light, then corruption can happen. Things things such as deputy gangs can run rampant and, and go unchecked. And so these deputy gangs that were identified in Compton, this is not the first time that deputy gangs have been confirmed throughout Los Angeles County. There were gangs in East LA. There were gangs um, also in the jails. And so this is something that must be addressed and not just brushed under the rug, but there also must be a continual light being shined, pressure by the community. Um, we have a new district attorney, uh, George Gascon, that came in um, strong and is uh, really focusing on reforms. And so we have to, as a collective unit, continue to put pressure at, at pressure points. And when windows of opportunity open, like elections, to be able to uh, instill better leadership, we need to make those decisions because um, it, it's very difficult to continue to fight an uh, individual system that's protected it's, uh, excuse me, an individual that's protected really by an antiquated system. We, we shouldn't have to have um, th this level of intervention from all these different sources just for some basic accountability, for, for basic transparency. Definitely, definitely. Okay, for sure. So I see you got about four minutes left. So I want to be very mindful of, of, of the last question here. Okay. But something that I'm really, really interested to know is... Um, and then I, I want to squeeze in here the, the the universal basic income, because I know that that's something that um, you have recently implemented in the city of Compton. Um, I just want to like talk a little bit about um, why that is important. How is that going to be sustained once you leave office? And then if we can, just a quick like what influenced your decision to support Mike Bloomberg for president? And I know that um, you guys had a, like a ceremony or not ceremony, but like, you know, you guys brought him to Compton and things like that. Like, what, 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 what was he running on that was um, so, like, interesting to you that you would endorse him for, um, for president? And then, yeah. I'll start with that question first. I, I was hoping that you would ask me that. Um, Mike Bloomberg was the only candidate running for president that actually had an actionable policy and direct investment for Black and Brown communities. Mm -hmm. Now, people can say what they want, but pull, pull down the facts. I'm a facts person. Um, I've dedicated my whole career to policy, to building communities, and we need direct resources. And we also need uh, a direct channel in order to actually receive those resources. And it's not enough to me that you're a career Democrat or that you're a part of the establishment or that you're a quote unquote progressive and that you still do not have direct investment for communities of color because there must be a direct response to systemic poverty. And the federal government has not even recognized the impact that redlining has made to communities of color. The ghettos didn't just happen on their, on their own. They were literally intentionally created by the systems that, and the powers that be. And so the United States of America, they owe black and brown communities of color, underserved communities, a direct response via reparations or direct investment. And I don't care what you call them, but there must be a direct investment to communities of color that have been literally shut out from building wealth. And so, again, Mr. Bloomberg, I challenge anyone, you pull down the current president's plan, you pull down any other candidate, and you compare them word for word, line for line, not, not rhetoric, not what the media chose to cover, compare those plans with direct dollar investment commitment, not a, a general policy of what we say we want to do, but direct money investment, home ownership, small business development, CDFI, community development financing institutions are huge. We do not even have them in our regions or communities because that is actually the receptacle on which federal dollars can be funneled into communities of color. And so these particular, um, th this strategy was about building real infrastructure to actually affect change in communities of color and specifically for black people. And so that, that influenced my decision because at this point I've been in politics. I, I, I knew even at that point that I was not going to serve another term. So it wasn't me looking for a, a, a layup in, in politics. I, if, if I continue to serve, that's God's will. But I knew that at this stage in, in my career that I'm going to support someone that's actually going to at least respect Black people enough to have an actual strategy on how to lift our communities, of how to lift communities of color, period. And so that, that was my decision on that. Um, in terms of um, your latter question, I'm sorry, I kind of got lost in the, the endorsement. Oh, my bad. It, kind, it was, um, you know, about the uh, universal basic income and oh, um, yes, yes. how the families in Compton receiving the uh, monthly, you know, 
um, extra monthly money? Yeah, so for guaranteed income, it was really simple for me. Um, we were in the midst of the COVID pandemic. Many people um, were without direct relief. We had stimulus payments that have been received. We didn't know when we were going to be receiving um, any direct aid from the federal government at that point. And so I knew we needed to do something. And so um, as I've watched the guaranteed income pilots around the nation, first of all, guaranteed income is not a new concept. Dr. King, um, he actually brought forward uh, guaranteed income to a broader um, kind of societal perception during his people's campaign, uh, which he was assassinated shortly thereafter. But guaranteed income was a basic tenet in order to reverse systemic uh, poverty and racism. And so um, I had already done my research on guaranteed income when I was approached to join a coalition for guaranteed income um, called the Mayors for Guaranteed Income, led by my brother, uh, former mayor, uh, Michael Tubbs, um, I joined because it was something that I was committed to doing for Compton. Um, the pilot is for two years. We raised um, $8 million to provide direct cash to um, Compton residents. And again, it's a two-year pilot, but I really wanted to focus on also adding to the greater body of work around guaranteed income because there hasn't been a pilot of this size in the nation that could actually produce statistics that actually can speak to what a guaranteed income, what a poverty floor can do for people of color, for communities of color. And so it was also about the broader movement about how comping could be a part of that. And also, of course, lifting our families at a critical time when we just couldn't rely on the federal government. And so it was a simple uh, answer for me at that time. Definitely, definitely. So since you're leaving, is this going to continue, though? Yes, um, the the Compton Pledge is completely separate from the city of Compton. I made sure it was set up independently so that it would continue to be sustained, uh, sustainable. Um, there is a strategy for ongoing um, support um, if the city decides that it would like to partner and support at a later date. But um, there is a, a, excuse me, a sustainability plan. But the main goal was to get uh, Compton families through this pandemic. And we didn't know how long the pandemic was going to last, but um, I'm hopeful that we will be able to, to open up and get back to basics. Um, well, at least I would say a new normal will never be quite the same, but I'm hoping that we'll be able to get through this rough patch in another, at least another year. Okay, definitely, definitely. So I know you got to run, but I have to try to squeeze this in here too. Um, somebody okay. <laughs> asking about the fires. It's the last thing I promise oh, you. Yes. I promise you. Um, okay. You know, there was a major, there was a huge fire yesterday in Compton. And um, I don't know if someone was saying that there's a, a, a fire right now happening in Compton, but um, specifically they were asking, um, are there any plans to prevent these fires or anything like, or any, just any thoughts about all the, these different fires that are happening in Compton? Yes, actually, we have a report coming forward from our fire chief to the city council on this upcoming Tuesday that was really going to pinpoint the source of the fires. Um, the first fire that we had a couple of weeks ago, um, it was really started by um, a shelterless individual. And this particular set of fires, from the current report that I had, it was actually um, something at a, a pallet yard and obviously pallets are highly f flammable. And so we are, they're still investigating the actual initial source, but from what has been reported, um, there was a tree that caught on fire that spread to the pallet yard and obviously it was just highly combustible. So I will um, hear from the fire chief on Tuesday on what the source of the issue is and then also what their mitigation strategy is. But um, we are an uh, older city. We do have a lot of um, kind of grandfathered uses um, and highly industrial as well. And so there uh, must be a, a new level of inspection for some of these older um, industrial operations so that we can just prevent um, fires from happening in the future. So that is what we are looking at currently. Um, and I look forward to reporting out. I do weekly um, lives. For those that are interested, I will be reporting out um, on Wednesdays about the outcome of that a particular investigation um, and then we'll also share the mitigation strategy moving forward okay definitely definitely well um i know you gotta run you know but i want to thank you again for your time like is there anything else that you just want the people to know that maybe we didn't touch on no i just want to thank you um for just being such a bright light and for just having so much love for community and for authentic narratives and voices um there, there's so much power in our voices and 
you just bring me so much joy in your coverage um, and just standing unapologetically for your perspectives. Um, and then being so humble to actually shift when you're introduced with new information. I've seen you do that, too. And that is just truly to be commended. Um, but I look forward to seeing your trajectory, your rise. Um, and I know that um, God has just wonderful things in store for you. So thank you for allowing me to come speak with you today. Yeah, definitely. Thank you for that feedback. You know, I'm just like just running and trying to you know keep going and staying consistent so I don't really know how it's being perceived until people tell me which they do you know and um mm -hmm. it's a balance because you know they <laughs> but yeah people but are rough right I know <laughs> yes <laughs> I will. God bless. And God bless everybody for that tuned in. I, I enjoyed reading the comments at the same time. You guys are great. Um, thank you so much. And I'll be in touch soon. Definitely. Okay. Take care, um, Asia. Have you a good too. one. Thank right, you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Peace. Okay, you guys. Y'all good, though? All right. Make sure y'all tap in with Henry Jones. I love this bag. I've been going through a transition, but I've been wearing this bag every day to remind me that, um, you know, we all uh, are in progress. But um, I hope you guys enjoyed that. I definitely will put that like on Instagram and YouTube, perhaps write an article. Yeah, good though. You know, I don't be on these lives, so I'm about to hop on here. Um, oh, hey, hello. Hey, boo. Um, I don't be on these lives, but since I was on here, before I hopped off, see if y'all had anything to say. Cool. I, I really enjoyed that interview. Um, make sure you guys stay tuned. My interview with Hub City Dre will be, what's tomorrow, Friday? Yeah, I'll upload that to the podcast. Um, he's running for Compton City Council District 2. And um, and yeah, you know, I hope y'all doing something that will feed your spirit today. Peace.